The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Be seated. Find your way in your Bibles to First John. That's where we'll be camping out this morning and for many other Sunday mornings. I won't, I won't tell you how many because I don't know how many. First John, uh, we're beginning a series through um, the Apostle John's letter to probably the churches of Asia Minor, and uh, Pastor Chris read 1 John 5, 13 um, earlier. I'm going to read 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but, for, but also for those of the whole world. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's, let's ask him for help. Lord God Almighty, we come before you this morning, and Lord, this ancient letter written thousands of years ago is your word, breathed out by your spirit through the pen of 
the Apostle John has been preserved and comes down to us now here in the year 2018. And it speaks to us with tremendous relevance and power. And Lord, you promised to use your word to work in the hearts and minds of people. We're reminded, as Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Your word restores, changes, turns the soul. It also makes wise those who are simple. It also enlightens the eyes and rejoices the heart. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do all those things this morning through your word. Lord, give us attentive minds to the truth of your word this morning in the midst of all the multitudes of distractions. Help us to settle our thinking before you so that our hearts might respond to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. If you follow Al Mohler's daily podcast known as The Briefing, uh, you will remember that this past week, January 2nd, he started off this 2018 season by saying three men walk into an op-ed piece on the New York Times. Uh, and it's supposed to be starting out like a joke. Three men walk into a bar, but he goes on to explain that in the op opinion editor's piece of the New York Times, there's a man by the name of Nicholas Kristof who has, over the past couple years, interviewed three different people. And Nicholas Kristof, as, as an editor in the New York Times, is, is a man who uh, has somewhat of a respect for the scriptures. He thinks that the teachings of Jesus are swell, but he does not believe in any of the supernatural things that take place in the scripture, the virgin birth of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, the union of God and man in Jesus Christ or the resurrection of Christ. And he's, over the past couple years, interviewed three different people asking them whether he is a Christian. One of the persons he interviewed most recently was a appointed cardinal, Joseph Tobin, in the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, he interviewed him, I think, on Christmas Eve, or at least it was the article was published on Christmas Eve. And he asked Cardinal Tobin whether he... Uh, whether he, Nicholas Kristoff, is a Christian. Whether one who denies the virgin birth of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, can be considered a Christian. And Christoph, or uh, Cardinal Tobin responds by basically saying that, well, as long as you're seeking, I wouldn't exclude you from that. The other interview uh, was with uh, the former president, Jimmy Carter, he was known as a theological liberal, and uh, when he asked President Carter whether one who denies the virgin birth of Christ, the resurrection, all these other fundamental tenets of the Christian faith would be considered a Christian, President Carter affirms, of course, I could not exclude you from the camp. The third person asked was the evangelical Tim Keller in which Tim Keller responded, well, basically, if you deny those fundamental tenets, it's hard to consider you as one who's a Christian. And he gave the example, if one was uh, considered to be part of Greenpeace and yet denied climate change, we would call for them to not be part of Greenpeace anymore. A in a similar way, you deny some of the fundamental tenets of the Christian faith, could you really be considered a Christian? Christoph was asking these questions, and, and they're very pertinent to our study in 1 John. Because John draws very clear boundaries, very clear boundaries, uh, and wants the churches to whom he's writing to to understand and know uh, whether they have eternal life or not. We're going to find out a little bit later 
that uh, the church in which he's writing to, or the churches probably, uh, several churches he's writing to, had been ransacked by false teaching. And John has to draw a, a line in the sand and say, those who deny certain truths are clearly outside the bounds of Christianity. And he wants those readers, those believers, to know and have certainty of their eternal life. And so he writes First John in that vein. And so this morning I want to give us three key ingredients to understanding this book, this letter of First John. Uh, this past week, somebody in our household wanted me to make pancakes. Um, so you go into the cupboard and there's no flour in the cupboard. And this individual in our family wanted me still to make pancakes. And I had to explain that Unless you have flour, you don't have pancakes. It is a key ingredient to pancakes. Uh, you'll just have milky eggs. You won't have pancakes. And in a similar way, each of these three ingredients are essential to understanding the book of First John. And, and I hope that, that as we do this study through First John, it's only five chapters long, that, that you will... Commit yourself to reading and rereading through this book and seeking to understand this book and to apply it to your life as we do this series over the upcoming months. But the first ingredient, the first key ingredient is the man. And all these start with an M for you young people, especially if you're taking notes so you can get some candy later on. The man, namely, who's the author of First John? Well, if you notice... The letter of John, fir first letter of John, does not start out the way most letters in the New Testament start out. For instance, you think of the book of Romans, you know, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, bond slave uh, of the Lord. Most letters in the New Testament start by saying who's writing this letter. But you notice that first John doesn't start that way. And also they'll say who's writing and who they're writing to. Most of the letters of the New Testament uh, start out that way. This does not start out that way. And, uh, and yet, at the same time, if you're reading your Bible, uh, at least in my New American Standard, it says at the top of the beginning of 1 John, the first letter of John. So, evidently, the editors, at least in the New American Standard, believe John wrote 1 John. And this is not without reason. It's not like this was just pulled out of the thin air. Um, the testimony, virtually unanimous testimony from all the early church, was that the Apostle John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. Uh, if you read an early church document called the Didache, uh, there's allusions to 1 John. Clement of Rome, 96 A.D., uh, seems to quote from 1 John. The epistle, epistle of Barnabas, probably 130 A.D., quotes from 1 John. Polycarp, Papias, Irenaeus, all these early church writers in the 2nd century believe that it was the Apostle John who wrote 1 John. And so there's really no reason for us to... Uh, try to come up with some other theory of who wrote 1 John because those who were closest within that generation believe that the Apostle John wrote 1 John. In fact, Colin Cruz, a contemporary commentator, says, what is clear from these citations is that the early Christian tradition is unanimous in ascribing 1 John to John, the disciple and the apostle of the Lord. But there's also evidence within the book of 1 John that John, the apostle, wrote 1 John. Notice when we look at the first three verses of chapter 1, it says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you 
the eternal life which was wha- which was from the, from the Father and manifest to us. What we see here is that the person who wrote First John is giving eyewitness testimony. He says, as, as we see here, we, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, the word of life. So we see eyewitness testimony, which would seem pretty basic that this was probably an apostle, someone who was a close associate of Jesus. But also notice the language that he uses to describe Jesus. Does that sound familiar? He calls him the word of life. There's only uh, two other times, as far as I know of, in the Bible that Jesus is described as the word. The first is in John 1.1. 1, 1. You're familiar with that, right? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The other one is in the book of Revelation. Revelation, I believe, uh, chapter 19 refers to Jesus as the word. And so it would seem consistent that it would be the same author of these three different books. We see also that he is an eyewitness and he speaks with apostolic authority. If you drop your eyes to chapter 4 and verse 5, as he points out these false teachers and distinguishes himself as a true teacher of God's word and a true apostle, it says in verse 5, they, these false teachers, are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. Verse 6, we are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. (coughs) He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth in the spirit of air. That's quite a statement. If you're of God, you listen to me. Now, you know, try using that on one of your friends. You know, if you're of God, you'll do what I tell you, right? Try that in your marriage. If you are of God, you will follow me in this decision. No, we don't speak like that because we're not apostles. Uh, the, the early church apostles spoke with that kind of authority. We also see, based on just reading through the letter of 1 John, that whoever's writing here, and I believe it's John the Apostle, he's writing as an elderly person, as an old man. Over and over throughout 1 John, we see in 1 John 2.1, He says, what, my little children, I am writing these things to you. If you drop your eyes down to verse 12 of chapter 2, I am writing to you little children. There's something about when you get older. Sonny, my child, little one, you you, you start to speak, uh, you know, everybody is, is... a kid, right? You know, <laughs> if they're uh, younger than you, they're a kid. Uh, even though they may be in their 60s, they're still a kid. <coughs> John is writing as an elderly person. And, and this would make sense because the, the unanimous testimony of the early church is John is writing in the latter years. And, and, and it makes sense that John wouldn't even have to identify himself and put his name at the beginning of the letter because everybody knew He was the last apostle standing when he writes at the beginning, that which I have heard, that which I have seen, that which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Everybody knew there's only one person still around who had touched Jesus, namely the apostle John. So what do we know about the apostle John? Who was this guy who wrote this letter? Well, we know that he was one of the inner three of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was one of the closest companions of Jesus. There's, there's three different instances in the gospel accounts that, that, that only three of the disciples are there to witness what Jesus does and what takes place. You remember one of them is at the Mount of Transfiguration where 
uh, the others stay back, but Peter, James, and John go there with Jesus and see Jesus transfigured before them. They see a conversation between Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Another instance is the healing of Jairus' daughter who had died. She was raised from the dead by, by Jesus. I think that's in Mark chapter 5. Well, it was only Peter, James, and John. Remember, James and John were brothers. They were fishermen. And then the other occasion is at Gethsemane on the eve of Jesus' execution. It's, again, Peter, James, and John who are there. So, so he's one of the closest of Jesus' disciples. We also discover that uh, there was a, a tremendously close personal relationship. And it, just like in the epistle of John, we see here John doesn't put his name at the beginning of the letter. He also doesn't refer to himself throughout the gospel of John. Remember, how does he refer to himself? As the disciple whom Jesus loved. In fact, he gives that description on the night before Jesus' execution as they were in the upper room and Jesus was teaching and Jesus instituted the Last Supper. Remember, he tells us that he was lying on Jesus' chest as they would have all been uh, not like the medieval paintings of the Last Supper. They're all sitting around a table. Well, I in the Middle East today, in the Middle East back then, there wasn't a table and everybody's sitting on chairs. They were lying on the floor. The table would have been a little mat in the middle of the floor and they would have all been laying down. And John is kind of leaning on Jesus' chest. Definitely highlighting the, the closeness between him and Jesus. His love and affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, Jesus clearly trusted him, even with his own family. Remember, as Jesus was hanging there on the cross in John chapter 19 and verse 26, as Jesus at that point, none of Jesus' brothers were true followers of him. And so John, the apostle, is there with Mary, Jesus' mother, and when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And then you say, well, what's going on here? Well, John tells us exactly what's going on. From that hour, the disciple took, that is, John the disciple took her into his own household. John the Apostle began taking care of Jesus' own mother. That's how close they were. John also was there with Peter on the morning of Jesus' resurrection, gazing upon the empty tomb. So he was a close companion of Jesus. Also, we get a little window into his personality in the Gospels. In, in uh, at least one of the lists of the disciples, James and John are given nicknames. Perhaps you remember what their nicknames were. Um, they are called, in Mark 3.17, Boagenes, that means sons of thunder, sons of thunder. And then we get a window into why Jesus might have called them sons of thunder by different passages, especially in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 9.49, John says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. So they, they say, uh, John says to Jesus, we, we saw somebody out there casting demons, but he's not one of us. And so we told him, you just stop that there. And Jesus' response is, if he's not against us, then he's for us. And then also, right after that, <laughs> there's this amazing account, Luke 9.51, where 
where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And this is the, the ascent to Jerusalem for Jesus' execution. And uh, he, he sends on ahead some of his disciples to make preparations for them to stay in a village in Samaria. And when the people in this village find out that Jesus and his followers are on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, they say, no, there's no vacancy here. You're not welcome. Shoo. And John comes back to Jesus and says, um, would you like us to call down fire from heaven? Maybe we can just say, nuke them. And poof. Evidently, John, being familiar with prophet Elijah in the Old Testament who had called down fire, said, you know, Jesus, maybe you could give us some of that fire. You know, that would come in handy right now because they're disrespecting us. Sons of thunder. In fact, uh, early church testimony, if you read Irenaeus, Irenaeus gives us a, a helpful insight into John's letters and the Gospel of John because he, he talks quite considerably about the heresy that John was dealing with, we'll talk about in a little while, called Gnosticism. But, but Irenaeus, he also records an instance where <coughs> evidently John is in this public bathhouse and a heretic by the name of Serinthus comes in. And John immediately gets out and says, let us fly even the, because even this bathhouse might come crashing down because Serinthus, the enemy of the truth, is here. So he says, I'm getting out of here. Here comes this heretic, and God might bring judgment on this bathhouse, and he leaves. Now, obviously, that's not in the Bible, but that's second century uh, testimony, but seems fairly consistent with the Apostle John which is what we see of him later on as we, as we read 1 John. Listen to some of the ways in which he speaks of the false teachers. Look at 1 John 2.18. He says, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it is the last hour. Drop your eyes down to verse 22. Who is the liar? But the one who denies Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. John's saying, you, you deny that Jesus is the Christ? You're a liar. Not only that, you're an Antichrist. <laughs> so we see here, John, John does not play around. He doesn't, he doesn't get chummy with false teachers and say, well, let's just hear them out. Let's just hear what they have to say. He says, no, you're a liar. You're an antichrist. You're a false teacher. He's not afraid to do that. He's a man who also is a man, as we see with his affection for Jesus, he, he's known as the beloved disciple or, or sometimes the apostle or disciple of love. Why? Because his emphasis over and over in the Gospel of John and in his letters is the importance of love. We see this later on in 1 John. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, and verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God is manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So he has a clear emphasis on the importance of love, but also an emphasis on the importance of truth. In the words of the Apostle Paul, he was one who knew how to speak the truth in love. He had this wonderful balance of truth and love. And of course, it's because he had the greatest teacher. 
who was the perfect balance of truth and love, right? The Lord Jesus himself, who who wasn't afraid to go toe-to-toe with the false teachers, the Pharisees and the scribes, and and to call them out with their hypocrisy and their lies, and and to, to speak the truth to them, but also we see him as a friend of tax collectors and sinners, one who is a man marked by love and compassion. And so this is a a beautiful balance that we see here in the scriptures. And and, and it's important as we're studying 1 John to understand John as the author that that he models this. And this is, we, we get some important application for our times. Because in our culture that embraces a kind of relativistic view of truth, when it comes to morals or many different matters of truth, especially as it pertains to religion, there's this belief that we can't be certain really about most anything. And yet, John the Apostle, in the midst of the fuzziness, speaks truth and says, you you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you're a liar, you're an antichrist. He'll say later on, you deny that Jesus has come in the flesh, you're an antichrist, you're a liar. But also, he does this because he cares about people, because he loves people. And he doesn't want them to be deceived by False teaching. In our day and age, so much of the church has been influenced by the culture around us so that we're we're afraid to call heresy heresy. We're afraid to call false teaching false teaching. This was illustrated uh, just yesterday. I was reading a thread on Facebook and a friend of mine had posted something about a a man who wrote an article for World Magazine, which is a a good source for information from a Christian worldview. But this man was, he was critiquing, what appeared to be critiquing, uh, John MacArthur's eulogy of R.C. Sproul. Because John MacArthur in his eulogy of R.C. Sproul, who recently died, he brought up this the evangelicals and Catholics together accord that, that R.C. Sproul fought so vehemently against. And basically what this was, was it was evangelicals and Catholics coming together, basically saying uh, there, there's, there's no essential differences between us. We believe in the same gospel. And, and Sproul and John MacArthur and D. James Kennedy said, no, you can't do this. They appealed to their evangelical brothers, don't do this. This muddies the water. This confuses the gospel. And so Joe Bells in this article says, everybody raised their eyebrows when John MacArthur brought this up in the eulogy. Like it was this sad, tragic thing that R.C. Sproul had done. No, the gospel was at stake. He needed to contend for it. Similar we need to take this cue from the Apostle John and be willing to contend for the truth. So that's the man, John the Apostle, the author of this letter. Secondly, the milieu. I'll throw down a French word for our young people. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Nick will tell me later on. The milieu. What was the context, the situation the environment in which John is writing to. We, we get clues as, as you read through this letter. If you look in chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, they, after he's just mentioned these antichrists who are now in the world, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. So evidently, 
the Apostle John and the, the context, the milieu in which he's writing to, the people in which he's writing to, was a church that had been severed by false teaching. False teachers who were within the church. Now, just let's try to place ourselves in their situation. Imagine here at Sovereign Grace Chapel, somebody who is a trusted teacher, has taught for some time, begins to subtly introduce errors and false teaching. And this false teaching begins to influence a good portion of the people here. And eventually this false teaching is called out, with, called out and dealt with, but this false teacher leaves the church and half of the church goes with him and starts a cult, a sect. And then there's half of the church that still remains, that's confused, shaken, uncertain, not sure where to go, not sure who to trust. And then they receive this letter from the Apostle John. That's the milieu. That's the context. These are people who've been shaken. These are people who are confused and they need a certain word from on high. They need an apostle under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God to write them this letter to give them certainties in which to hang their life upon. To help them to know that they have eternal life. To help them to know that these are false teachers. These are lies. That they have the truth. They don't need to be, be influenced by these lies. If you drop your eyes later on in the same chapter. Chapter 2 and verse 26. John tells us why he's writing. One of the reasons he says I write these these things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. He's writing to them because he's concerned that there are wolves who are trying to devour some of the sheep. And they need to be called out. Well, what do we know about this false teaching that was influencing the church and had ravaged the church and even split the church? Well, we can gather a handful of things just by reading the letter. Uh, but we also get more information uh, from, as I mentioned, Irenaeus, a second century writer. He mentions this false teaching as what you might call as a seed form of what was known as Gnosticism. Spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. Not to be confused with Nakis, which are delicious Italian noodle kind of thing. Gnosticism, from, from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, okay? And so these guys, they, they, they taught, it, it was kind of a, a, a scrambled egg of some of Greek philosophy, some Christianity and a little bit of Judaism all kind of scrambled up in an egg for this kind of Gnostic omelet. And, and, and so it was, it was, it was, it was, there's all these different ideas and beliefs. And one, one tenet of it was that they taught that matter, physical, is evil while spirit, the immaterial, is good. And so this led them to believe and teach that if matter is evil, if the physical is evil and the spirit is good, we, we can't believe that Jesus had a real physical body with flesh and blood and bones because that would mean that Jesus is evil. And so one branch of this Gnostic teaching was called docetism, from the Greek word dikeo, which means to appear. And so they, thought, they taught 
that Jesus just appeared to have a human body. He didn't actually have a human body. Now, this makes sense then as we read the opening verses of 1 John. How does, he, how does he start it? He says, that which we heard, that which we saw, that which we touched. In other words, don't tell me Jesus didn't have a real physical body. I was there. I touched his body. I saw his body. I heard his voice. This is why he says later on in, in 1 John chapter 4, when he says, uh, do not believe every spirit, verse 1, test the spirits to see whether they come from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus, notice this, has come in the flesh is from God, and the spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. In other words, one of the hallmark tenets is, is believing Jesus had real flesh. If you deny Jesus had real flesh, a real body, John's saying, that's false. That's not from the Spirit of God. There was another form of this kind of seed form Gnosticism or incipient Gnosticism. And what, the reason why I say seed form is because it, it, be, it kind of grows and flourishes by the time of the second century. It's just this, this kind of whole system. And uh, by the way, many of the, you know, every once in a while, you know, it's usually around Easter or Christmas, um, Time Magazine or National Geographic or one of these places will come out and say, uh, you know, we know, you know, we know that there's this gospel out there and the early church hid this gospel. And so, you know, it's, it's the gospel of Judas that's the real gospel or the gospel of Thomas. By the way, most of these gospels, those gospels were written by the Gnostics. OK. And uh, and by the way, this is just as an aside, there was no kind of early church conspiracy, let's burn all those books. But, but it was known in the early church, as we see from the testimony of the Apostle John, no, these are false teachings. We don't believe this stuff. Um, because you have to understand the, that conspiracy theory, that kind of Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code idea that, that there was this conspiracy and the church was this powerful entity and, and they, you know, they did away with all these other gospels the church didn't become much of a political, powerful entity until the fourth century. The first three centuries, they were a ragtag group of people running for their lives. And so they didn't have any power or control to control what, you know, what books, uh, you know, were to be kept and what, you know, some were to be burned or whatever. Uh, now, granted, they used their church authority to call out these false teachers and to point them out. The second uh, kind of branch of Gnosticism was what was called Serinthian Gnosticism. I mentioned Serinthus, who came to the bathhouse uh, as and John ran out. Serinthian Gnosticism uh, was similar to uh, Docetic Gnosticism, but, but one unique aspect of Serinthian Gnosticism was it taught that the, the Christ spirit emanated and came upon Jesus at his baptism and left Jesus before his crucifixion. And uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we see this puzzling verse in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6 when John says, the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with water and with the blood. In other words, at the baptism and at his death, Jesus was the Christ through and through. Uh, and then he says it's the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. And so these this is the context in which John is writing to a church that had been ravaged and influenced by false teaching, was confused and battered and needed the certainty of truth to hang their lives upon. So that's the the man, the milieu. Thirdly, the message. What's the message of one John? Well, 
here's my summary statement of the message of 1 John. To help God's people to enjoy the certainty of eternal life by showing them the idolatry of false teaching and the true signs of the faithful. To help God's people be certain about eternal life by showing them the false teaching, the idolatry of the false teaching, and the certainty of the truth and the evidences of those who are in the truth. And, and this is, the, again, this is the beautiful balance of 1 John where, where, where he has a kind of pastoral concern over the, these believers who are his audience being certain that they have eternal life but also this kind of sharp edge to call out the false teaching. Charles Haddon Spurgeon in the 1800s, the Victorian Baptist preacher, he had a magazine called The Sword and the Trowel. And a trowel is, is, is a tool uh, that was used in the book of Nehemiah to help build the walls. And the sword... Also, he, he drew this imagery from the book of Nehemiah. If you remember the book of Nehemiah, as they're building the walls, they need the sword to fight off those who were attacking. I, and, and you see that here in 1 John. He, it's like he has a, a trowel in one hand. He's building up these believers, helping them to have assurance and certainty of eternal life and to bank their life upon the truth so that they're growing in the Lord. But then he has a sword in the other hand to fight off the false teaching. First, we see this trowel in some of these purpose statements. And, and you might ask, how do you, how do you know, how do you summarize what the message of a book is? Um, there, there's different ways that you can do that. Uh, looking for repeated phrases over and over. Um, looking at the beginning of the book and the end of the book. Often there's kind of something at the beginning and something similar at the end that gives you an insight as to what the entire message of the book of the Bible is. And sometimes... Uh, authors of books of the Bible tell you why they wrote, which is very helpful. <laughs> it, it, it basically minimizes the work that you have to do. And thankfully, John, in, in several different places, he tells us why he's writing. Pastor Chris read one of these at the beginning in, in, in 1 John 5.13. I'll read it again for you. It says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So he writes so that they would know that they have eternal life. At the beginning of the books, it says that in chapter 2 and verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he's writing with a concern for their experience as Christians. One, that they wouldn't sin, assumption that they would be growing in godliness, but also that they would have certainty, I have eternal life, I'm on my way to heaven. And so he sprinkles throughout the book these different kinds of tests so that they can be certain that they have eternal life. And some of these are doctrinal tests, as we mentioned already, that you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. You have to believe that he's come in the flesh. You have to believe in the incarnation. There's certain moral tests as well. Practicing of righteousness we'll see in chapter 3. Or if you look at uh, the end of chapter 2, in verse 29, it says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So that one of the evidences that you are born of God is that you practice righteousness. That you believe certain truths about who Jesus is. That you live a certain way and then... These you might call social evidences or social tests is basically love for the brethren. If you look at chapter 2, in verse 7, he says, Beloved, I am not 
writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light, yet hates his brother, is in the darkness until now. The one who's, so, so you say you're in the light, you say you know the truth, yet you hate your brother. No, you're in the darkness. Next verse. Verse 10, the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. If you love your brother, then you evidence that you're abiding in the light. Verse 11, the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in, walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. It's blinded his eyes. So he gives these different tests, and we'll see these throughout, of questions to ask yourself. Is, is there love for the brother? Is there practicing of righteousness? Are you believing, trusting in those basic tenets of the Christian faith? And if you are, then you can have certainty. You can know that you have eternal life. It doesn't have to be fuzzy. It doesn't have to be, well, I'm not sure. Or I don't know who's in, who's out. You can know. But then also, if there aren't any of those evidences, you can know that you don't have eternal life. And you need to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus. Trust in this one who he says in chapter 2 is a propitiation for our sins. That's the, the trowel. Now let's look at the sword. As I mentioned, the milieu, the context in which John is writing is false teaching, so it would make sense that he's going to contend against this false teaching. He's going to point it out. And so wouldn't you know, at the beginning of the letter, at the end of the letter, we, we see some important things. He starts the letter, as I mentioned already, in chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. We have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. He starts the letter by telling them who Jesus is. And he knows who Jesus is because he touched him. He heard him. He saw him. And so he upholds the truth about Jesus as both as God and as man and what he came to do. But then also negatively, if you turn to the very end of the book, this seems almost out of place unless you understand the whole of the book. The very last verse in the entire book chapter 5 and verse 21 little children guard yourself from idols what idols an idolatrous view of the god man jesus christ in other words any belief about jesus that does not stand the test of the apostles as Jesus is the God-man is idolatry. And so you need to guard yourself from that. So again, the message of 1 John is to help God's people enjoy the certainty of eternal life by showing them the idolatry of false teaching and the true signs of the faithful. You might ask yourself, why is this so important that, I mean, why is the humanity of Jesus so important? I, you know, I kind of get that the deity of Jesus, the godness of Jesus is important. I mean, but why is the humanity of Jesus so important? And really, I think John's answer would be without the humanity of Jesus, without the incarnation the crucifixion doesn't matter. 
I mean, think about it. If he didn't really die, if he didn't have a, a, a real human body, then he couldn't have actually died. He couldn't be that sacrifice. And, and that's why we see in, in, in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, he has what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sin. He is a sacrifice. He appeased the wrath of God because he had a real human body and could be a real actual sacrifice for sin. We see it later on in 1 John 4, 9. By this, the love of God is manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. The incarnation is necessary because without it, there's no propitiation. There's no sacrifice for sin. And so your eternal life hangs on the reality of Jesus actually being human. And any departure from that belief, John calls idolatry, a skewing of the God-man. And so it's appropriate that we close there as we think about the Lord's table and that what he instituted as our Lord, as the one who instituted the new covenant in his blood, he does this so that we would remember his crucifixion. That's what he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that we're to do this, what, in remembrance of me, Jesus says. And so I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts as we partake and remember the Lord's Supper. The Lord has given this to us, as I mentioned, to be a reminder of, of his death and resurrection. But it is something that he has given to believers to partake in. And so if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus, you've not yet been united to him by faith, then, then I would uh, encourage you not to partake with us. But if you are a believer, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus, you can partake and remember his death and resurrection. Lord God, we come before you and we thank you for the perfect saving work of Jesus. We thank you for this letter of 1 John that helps us to understand the importance of truth, helps us to understand that we can indeed be certain about our salvation, our eternal life, that we can know the truth, in the midst of a world of fuzziness, we thank you that we have the clarity of a word from on high, not because we're smarter than anybody, no more than anybody, but because you as the all-knowing God has spoken to us. And because you know all things, we can know with certainty. And so, Lord, we pray now as we partake of the supper that you would fill our minds with sweet thoughts of you and what you have done on our behalf for your glory and for our good. Amen. The men are going to...